Thanks, and thanks so much for having me. I know also this is near the, well, it's late afternoon, um, so feel free to interrupt me at any time. We don't just need to do questions at the end. We're, um, I'm happy to take questions throughout the time. Um, before I start, I want to make sure to highlight um, my awesome group who actually does all of the work. Um, in particular, I photoshopped in a couple extra people. Um, uh, Chris Dan over on the right was responsible for leading a lot of the policy certificate work. Um, uh, Yao uh, was one of the lead authors for some of the other work I'll mention, and Andrea is another key member. So if you look at the news right now, um, there's a lot of talk, whether you're looking at sort of news articles or social media, talking about whether or not artificial intelligence is gonna automate humans. And to some extent, that was sort of one of the initial goals of AI, not necessarily to automate or replace us, but to try to create artificial intelligent agents that could work as well as people can. Um, and one of the concerns about doing this is that if we do this really well, then maybe robots will replace our jobs. And so whether we're thinking about being a truck driver or whether we're um, a doctor or a medical profession, there's a lot of interest and concern in whether or not um, our jobs might be taken away. But in parallel to uh, this direction of automating people or trying to exceed um, or reach the capabilities of people is the idea of artificial intelligence to augment human capabilities. And so that's the focus that I think about a lot in my own lab is to think about how do we make AI systems that can kind of compensate with, for some of the limitations of human ingenuity and creativity so that we end up with joint human AI partnerships where we can do things together that we can't do alone. Now, in particular, I think about this a lot in the context of reinforcement learning systems. Um, and there's been a huge amount of progress in reinforcement learning over the last um, 30 years, um, and in particular over the last few years. And I just want to briefly highlight some of the places we're making uh, gains and some of the limitations. So in the theoretical progress in reinforcement learning, um, I think we've seen a lot of really amazing gains on sort of small tabular-like settings um, by our group and lots of other groups. We've been thinking about sort of formal bounds for how much data we need to learn in these types of settings. But of course, the, these are quite far from the type of settings we'd like to be able to tackle. In particular, we'd like to be able to think about these sort of really rich, complicated, messy domains, which is AI systems that are interacting with humans. And we'd like to be able to have guarantees and accountability for how these systems do in these type of scenarios. On the other hand, we've had some really astounding um, advances in reinforcement learning um, in the empirical side. And the success of uh, RL agents that can play Atari games um, or win at Go or in robotics are really incredible. But when we look at those systems, they sort of have a number of different capabilities. And in particular, they tend to be situations where it's quite cheap to simulate things, um, or we might have pretty good models we can write down about how the world works. So we don't have perfect physics simulators, but we have pretty good physics simulators, and we can use those to simulate how robots might be. In contrast, if we think about people, it's really, really hard to model people. Um, I came into the sort of application areas I look at thinking about things like education. I'm doing some work now also on the healthcare space. And in both of those settings, I think there are scenarios where it's really, really hard to, to model how people learn, what their physiology is, how they're gonna react to different scenarios. Um, and we'd really like to have applications to these type of systems as well. So what the goal is of my lab is uh, really focused around this issue of how do we have accountable reinforcement learning for high stakes domains. Um, and when I say accountable, I'm referring to sort of the recent trends in fairness, accountability, and transparency in machine learning. Um, and accountability can allow us to know how well we're doing. And if we know how well we're doing, we can choose whether or not we want to take the system's recommendations or, or use the system or decide not to. And so I think um, accountability can lead to us being able to have better human, um, human AI partnerships um, by allowing the humans to better trust and decide whether or not they want to use these systems. So probably, actually I'll just do a quick poll. Who here has taken the class where we've covered reinforcement learning? Okay, most people, but not everybody, so I'll do a quick five second um, overview of reinforcement learning. Um, this is not the normal example you'd probably have, uh, probably with a robot, but uh, one way to think about reinforcement learning is that you have a system, say the computer, um, and it gets to select actions, which in this case might be something like a math exercise, and give it to the environment. So here, that's a student. So our, our computer, or our automated teacher is gonna give a math exercise um, to a student. And then the student will give some answer back. Um, so sort of some observation. And then we're also gonna get some sort of reward. 
And this reward might only happen periodically, like we might periodically be able to uh, observe whether or not the student passes a test. And we, when we think about this, of what this sort of agent should do, we can think of there being a policy, which is a mapping from previous interactions, the previous actions taken by the agent and responses seen and rewards, to decide what is the next exercise or what is the next action the system should take. And we typically think about evaluating the quality of a particular decision policy in terms of its expected sum of rewards. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, about whether or not we might want other objective functions, but that's the typical one. But the big challenge is that in reinforcement learning, we don't know how the world works. So we don't know how the decisions that are made impact student outcomes or impact the next state. So we don't have a pre-specified statistical model of how uh, the world works, and we need to learn that over time while we're trying to achieve high reward. And so this is the general setting of reinforcement learning, where we have an agent that's trying to learn to make decisions in the world and get high reward while it doesn't know what's going on um, all at the same time. And I think that it's very arguable that this sort of sequential decision making under uncertainty is very similar to the types of challenges that people have to solve when they're learning to grow and be part of society. So the first thing that I want to talk about today is um, how do we have reinforcement learning systems that reason about the past? Um, I think this is a very important setting for a number of cases. And let me just talk a little bit about what I mean. Uh, so let's imagine that we have some set of classrooms, the A classrooms, and in them they first see a computer and then they, um, they use the computer to do an activity and then they use a chalkboard and then they take a test and they get an average score of 95. And then we have the B classrooms where they first do the chalkboard exercise, then they use the computer and they get a score of 92. And the question is what we should do for a new student. And my question to you is, what sort of information would I have to tell you um, in order for you to make that decision about what you would recommend we do for a new student? Yeah? We'd want to know what new interventions we could have. Yeah, so one question might be, you know, are we uh, allowed to have the same set of interventions? Are we allowed to extrapolate? Is this the only set of sequences we could have? What other things might you want to know? Yeah? How much do we care about this student? <laughs> that could be another thing too, yeah. So are we trying to optimize for this particular student? Let's imagine that we are, but yes, it could be whether or not we even care about the outcome. Any other things we might want to consider? Yeah. Beyond just the performance, what are the differences in the demographics of the two classrooms? Right, exactly. So um, I haven't told you anything about the A classrooms and the B classrooms, nor which type of student the new student is. Um, the A classrooms might be kindergartners, the B classrooms might be college students, um, which might be unfortunate, uh, but nevertheless, uh, that might be useful information to know. Okay, so all of these things are really useful. Another thing that people sometimes bring up when I give up this example is that uh, you might want to know if that reward function, that test, is correlated at all with the activities. Now that sounds sort of like a simple thing, like of course, why would you do an English exam after giving people math exercises? But it turns out that in a lot of our AI systems, sometimes we are doing something like that, where we have a reward mismatch, where we're asking our system to optimize something which is different than what we really want or what we're giving it the tools to do. So I think that's, that's less trivial of an issue than you might imagine. So why is this a hard challenge? Well, you know, one of the reasons this is a hard challenge is because it fundamentally involves counterfactual reasoning. Because of the issue that was just raised, I did not tell you what type of demographics we have in the two classrooms and if they're comparable. And therefore, you can't know what would have happened in the B classrooms if you had done the other order of activities. And so you can think of this data as sort of being censored. Um, so the, the problem is, is that in many, many situations, you can't see what would have happened if you did something differently. If you had treated your patient differently, if you had taught your student fractions and then algebra instead of the other way around, you can't reset the system and try it again, and so you just can't observe the other outcome. So that makes it really hard. Um, and there's a really nice uh, talk by Judea Pearl, who's sort of one of the founders of thinking about these types of issues, where he argues that our ability to do counterfactual reasoning is really a core part of what makes us intelligent. You know, we can imagine things like half humans and half horses, and that allows us to sort of extrapolate from our experience in a way that maybe most other species cannot. Okay, so one challenge is this counterfactual reasoning problem. The other is this generalization to the untried, and this also sort of came up, which is you can imagine, even, in, even imagining we're still restricting ourselves to computers and chalkboards. Um, in this case, I showed you sort of two different orders, 
And then there are two other orders that we didn't try, and you'd like to be able to generalize to how good those were. And in general, you'd like to be able to generalize to many other different types of sequences. There's going to be a combinatorial set of different sequences, and you're not going to want to think about all of them. And this sort of challenge of taking this old data to try to reason about what we should do comes up in all sorts of domains. So it comes up in things like equipment maintenance, and it comes up in healthcare, and it comes up in education, and um, consumer marketing. And there are many, many cases where we're having growing amounts of data about decisions made and their outcomes, and we'd like to use it to make better decisions. So we don't just want to do prediction, but we want to do decision making. So what I'm going to talk about right now is um, the off-policy policy evaluation question. Um, and what I mean in this case is that we're going to look at a particular policy, and we want to know how good it is. So we're going to imagine that we have some previous data that was collected under some behavior policy, which might be that half the time we show a computer then a chalkboard, and the other half the time we show a chalkboard then a computer. And we want to use that data to estimate how good would it be if we did computer computer. So that's going to be sort of our target or our evaluation policy. And the reason we might want to do this is so that then we can make decisions about whether that new evaluation policy is something that we should use in practice. So how could we maybe approach this? So one way we could approach this is to try to build a statistical model from our data. So we have all this data from decisions made in their outcomes um, from some behavior policy mu. And we could build a statistical model. So we could build a model of the dynamics and a model of the reward function. And then we could optimize it or use it as a simulator. So once you have a statistical model, this is sort of us thinking back to the first example I said, saying that you know for robotics or Atari games, we can have a simulator often. And once we have a simulator, we can optimize or evaluate using that simulator. We can pretend that's the real world, and so we can evaluate how good it would be to do a different policy. So this is nice, um, but there's a number of problems with that. Um, one is that models can be biased. And so if we have the wrong model, um, even if we have tons and tons and tons and tons of data to fit our beautiful neural network model, um, then its predictions of how good this policy is going to be are still wrong. And you're, probably many of you are familiar with this, but for those of you that aren't, um, one simple way to think about this is imagine if I gave you a really, really simple model, which is all students are in the same state always. Doesn't matter how you teach them, nobody learns anything, um, and you're always in the same state. So if you were to fit that model, no matter how much data you have, it would still be wrong, and it wouldn't allow you to get a good estimate of how good a particular teaching policy would be. So this is one approach um, model uh, to do model-based. A second approach is to say, OK, maybe we don't want to do models. Um, maybe we want to sort of directly estimate how good this new policy would be. And what we're going to do here is we're just going to kind of reweigh our data. We're going to use important sampling. So we're going to take the distribution of data that we would get under one policy and try to reweigh it so it looks like the distribution of data we'd get under another policy. And we can do this, and this is nice, and it's unbiased. Um, and in some of our early work, we did this um, and applied it to educational games. And we found that we could use this type of technique and combine it with optimization um, to yield things like a 30% higher engagement policy on an educational game. So this can be pretty powerful, but it also has some limitations. And in particular, it can be really high variance. And why is that bad? That's bad because if it's really high variance and then you're trying to compare estimators, then it may be really hard to tell what you want to do. So a natural approach might be a third thing that's been often done in prior work, which is doubly robust, which is essentially just do both and combine them. It's a little more complicated than that, and um, I'm sure many of you in the audience already think about these type of estimators, um, but essentially it's going to hopefully combine the benefits of a model um, with the benefits of important sampling. So all of this is really nice prior work, but when we started to look at this new domain um, in healthcare, it was clear that there was some uh, limitations to this prior work. So this is a collaboration with Finale Joshi's lab, um, and one of the challenges that came up uh, is that often we assume that the behavior policy is known. So what do I mean by that? I mean that the data, how the data was collected, we're assuming that we have access to that behavior policy. And in some cases, that's really a very reasonable thing. So if your decisions are being made by a computer, like you're deciding whether or not to show an ad to a customer, we have to know what that behavior policy is. It's what's never in your code. 
So, so we definitely know what it is. We can say, hey, for this particular customer, um, the probability of them seeing this ad is X. We have an explicit form of the policy. So in these settings, it's pretty realistic, but in many other cases, we don't. So when we have doctors that are you know, making medical decisions, they don't normally write down, you know, with probability 0.3, I'm gonna suggest amputation, with probability 0.7, I'm not. And then write that down for all different types of patients. So in many cases, we don't know um, sort of what was the policy, the decision policy used to gather the data. And those sort of important sampling methods that I mentioned before rely on us knowing that. So that's one challenge. A second is that most prior work has, or much of prior work, particularly in kind of the statistics community, has thought about it when you're gonna make a single binary decision. So you have some data and you'd like to estimate for say for this particular patient, um, Am I gonna give them an injection or am I gonna pres prescribe some medication? And then I look at the outcomes, so time stops. But in many situations, we wanna think about doing lots of adaptive decisions over time. So I don't wanna think about making a single, single decision, I wanna think about making a particular recommendation and then after that, observing how the patient does and then making a different decision. And you can think of kind of these branching policies, these conditional branching policies over time. So, we need methods in this case that can really reason about the sequential decision making over time compared to thinking about there being sort of a binary decision. Another challenge is that a lot of these prior estimators assume a stochastic um, evaluation policy. So that means that po the policy that we're interested in evaluating itself is stochastic. Now, let me just be clear. Um, we have to assume there's some stochasticity in the data that we get. Um, otherwise, we can't evaluate anything else. So for example, if uh, you have a policy such that all students only ever use the computer to learn, you can't evaluate what it would be like if they had also used um, a book, because you don't observe that. So we have to assume that there's some sort of variability in the data that we've received in order to try to make better decisions in the future. This is the question about whether we're evaluating the thing that we wanna see how good it is, whether itself is stochastic. And so that would mean it looks like something like this, where you have an input patient, and then you output a probability distribution over these different types of treatments. The problem is, is that in many cases, that's not true. So in many cases, we don't think about there being a probability distribution over things we should do for a patient. We think of there being a single thing. We think of making a deterministic policy. And then a final thing that we observed is that a lot of these methods sort of estimate the mean accuracy. So we'd have something like this, V here, oops, that uh, the hat moved a little bit, but the V that now has sort of a weird squiggly in the middle of it, um, can think of that as being the approximation. And what that's saying is how good is our estimate of this policy for this particular patient minus the real value for that patient. So that's sort of the error in our estimate of how good this policy is for a patient. And what a lot of methods do is they say, if we average over all types of patients or average over all types of individuals, what's our average accuracy? So what's our estimated mean accuracy? But when we think about what we'd actually like to do, particularly in high stakes situations, often we don't want just average uh, accuracy, we want individual accuracy. We wanna know for this particular student, you know, how should we teach them? Or for this particular patient, what policy should we deploy? And so we want to get estimates of individual accuracy instead of average accuracy. So the problem is, is that when we think about all four of these challenges, this issue that we might not know the behavior policy, we want to deal with long, uh, sort of many action sequential data, we want to think about deterministic evaluation policies, and we want to think about making guarantees on performance and accuracy for individuals, um, we don't have existing tools to try to do this. So the previous methods tend to fail in at least one or more of these circumstances, and yet this was exactly the sort of data that we were looking at last fall. So what was our insight? Our insight was we're going to be model-based, but we're going to try to build models in a careful way um, uh, with a new type of loss function. And this was really inspired by some of the work that um, has been coming out of David Sontag's group, uh, thinking about similar ideas for um, uh, the single time step, sort of single decision case. And we also want to leverage some of the really nice results in sort of deep learning to try to build really powerful um, function approximators for these models and use them. 
So what we'd like to be able to have is we'd like to be able to have models that say for this patient, if we give them this particular um, action, aka treatment, um, we want to build a model that can predict the dynamics and the reward in terms of what might happen. And this is work that's going to appear in NIPS. So we're going to build models, and we're going to hopefully build models in a way that we can understand how good they are and sort of the generalization guarantees, um, and use them to tackle these types of problems. So how do we do this? Well, um, what we looked at first is the simulation lemma on the error in the value estimate. So some of you guys might be familiar with this, but as a refresher, what the simulation lemma shows is it looks at differences in models, differences in Markov decision process models. And it says if you have two different Markov decision process models and you're trying to evaluate what is the value you'd get under each of the two models for the same policy, how far away can they be? So if they both have the same transition model and the same reward model, they have to be identical. But if one of them has a slightly different transition model or a slightly different reward model, they're going to give you different value estimates for the same policy. And what the simulation lemma says is that you can decompose this into two parts. You can think about what is the error in the reward function, which is the first term, and what is the error in the transition model times your future value. So it's kind of this weighted transition model error. And you could sum this up over all the time steps. So here t equals 0 to h is going to be sort of the horizon of how many decisions you get to make in the problem. So this just allows us to see where might error come in. So we're going to try to build these models of dynamics and reward models. They're going to be wrong. And we're going to hopefully account for how wrong they can be and try to bound it so we get good estimates of how this policy is going to do for a particular individual. So the first insight was to say, well, we want to be able to assume that we don't know how the behavior policy, um, what the structure is of the behavior policy. We don't have an explicit form for that. So we need a way to sort of account for the mismatch of the data that we see um, and the data that we would see under our new policy. So this is sort of the, the covariate shift, um, because if you were to use a new policy, you would get different data than what you saw before. So the insight is that we want to be able to not use important sampling, which requires us to have to know um, the behavior policy, but we want to use other quantities that we can estimate directly. And what you can see here is that we're going to use conditionals over the probability of observing different actions that match our desired target policy pi in the data. So the two things that I've underlined there are things that we can just average, we can just compute the averages of them in our data, and that allows us to avoid the important sampling. We don't have to know about um, the, beha the behavior policy. We can instead just use things we can evaluate empirically from data. And this is a um, sort of this insight builds on the, the one step case from uh, David Sontag's lab. It's thinking about that for the one step situation. So this allows us to sort of say we can, don't have to know the unknown behavior policy. The second challenge is that. If we are in these sort of long horizon cases and we have these deterministic evaluation policies, most of our data that we've got will not look like the data that we're going to get in our new policy. So you could imagine that um, if you're looking at a treatment policy, which not many people got in your data, then it's hard to estimate how good it is. So if we think about this being the sort of standard mean squared error for the policy we care about, by definition, that has to be smaller than that plus something else. Now, what I've done here is I've said we're going to say the mean squared error for the policy we care about is by definition less than the mean squared error for the policy we care about plus the mean squared error for your behavior policy. Now, when you first look at this, you might think this is a horrible idea. Um, and indeed, some of the reviewers asked us about this. Um, like You just made your mean squared error worse. You just added something on. But the intuition for why we might want to do this is that we're going to try to construct an upper bound to what your mean squared error could be for your uh, evaluation policy and regularize. So a little bit like how often in deep learning right now you do fine tuning, where you fit a model on a lot of data and then you fine tune it on the small data set you care about. We have a lot of data here about your behavior policy. We're going to regularize the model we fit towards being like that and having a good mean squared error on that sort of behavior policy and then kind of fine tune it to also do well on our target distribution we care about. So that's the insight here. And so that allows us to derive a particular loss for how we're going to fit these sort of high dimensional models. 
which we're gonna sort of fit two aspects. We're gonna learn a model that's good for both estimating the behavior and the evaluation policy. So we wanna be able to look at the data that you'd get either under the behavior policy or the target policy and account for the distribution mismatch. Do we have any questions about any of that? Okay. So the nice things is that if we do this, then you can get finite. You can still get finite sample bounds um, on the model error. So we can still know how good this model is. Um, and if you pick a powerful model class, like some forms of deep neural networks, then you can still be guaranteed that as you get lots of data, you're going to actually get the right estimator. You really can get consistency. As you get more and more and more data, then you're gonna get a true estimate of how good that target policy is. Um, and then the other nice thing is that, well, now you have a model. So now you could use it as a simulator to try to evaluate how good a policy is. You can just do rollouts or whatever else you'd like to do with that model. So what does this buy us? Um, so this is cart poll for those of you that might not be familiar with it. It's sort of one of the standard simple um, RL benchmarks. It's a small domain, just a, a few dimensions, um, but it's illustrative. So in this case, we're assuming that we have some data from cart poll and we want to evaluate um, the value of an alternative target policy. And we want to see how good our estimates are. And we're going to compare it to a bunch of different things. So we can look at what our model estimator is or what would happen if we use doubly robust by combining this with an important sampling estimator. We can look at just fitting our model um, using maximum likelihood, so not doing our special loss trick. Um, uh, you can look at how much the fact that, that we're doing this behavioral policy regularization helps you. So I said that we added this mean squared error on, um, and that seemed kind of crazy, but hopefully it's going to help us. Um, and we can look and see exactly how much that helps us here. And then we also compare it to this recent method in ICML, which is also trying to build good models for this type of problem. And so what you can see in this case is that um, the two things on the left, which are using our new model, um, are, have substantially smaller mean squared error than the things on the right. Um, and here, in fact, the, just using the model by itself is best. So we're also comparing how good are we at estimating sort of the population mean, where we're averaging over the distribution of individuals, or instances in this case, so states, um, as well as uh, for individual guarantees. And you can see some of those ones are um, dot, uh, blanked out, and that's because they can't provide individual estimates. So that was something else we said we wanted. We want to be able to make individual estimates of how good a policy would be. So one of the things I want to highlight here, this is also true if we make the horizon short. So our method is particularly perhaps helpful if we have longer horizons, but it's usual, useful even if you have a fairly small number of decisions. Um, and one thing I want to highlight is that our method doesn't have to know the behavior policy form, but these other methods do, and it's still doing better. So we're actually giving these other methods, a number of these other methods, more information than what our approach does, and it still does better, even though it doesn't know the true behavior policy. So there's also this nice additional aspect that you can't get the individual estimates for most states that are outside of the data set unless you explicitly build a model. And that again could be pretty useful because you could imagine that maybe you have a set of 100 patients and then a new patient comes by that looks different than all of the patients you've seen before and you still want to be able to understand whether or not this new policy will be good for that new patient. We also looked at an HIV simulator um, and again found that this yielded some beneficial results. So we're again going to get sort of a better mean squared error than these other alternative approaches. So what does this buy us? Um, this sort of form of doing what we're calling representation balancing. So we're leveraging sort of old data and we're explicitly building um, a representation and a model of the MDP um, that we think will tackle these type of different challenges um, this issue of not knowing the behavior policy, long horizons, wanting deterministic evaluation policies and individual estimates um, is pretty promising. But let me just highlight why this is not all done, which is that was for offline policy evaluation which means that we want to be able to understand how good a particular policy is. But of course, in reality, we really care a lot about policy optimization. So we want to not just say, well, this is how good it would be if you were to do this particular policy, but what is the policy you should deploy? So for this particular student, how should we teach them? Or for this particular patient, how should we treat them? And that involves us making a decision about what to deploy. <coughs> 
So you might wonder, um, okay, maybe we can just do this like offline policy evaluation thing um, and that's gonna be sufficient for doing good policy optimization. So what do I mean by good? Um, well, it turns out that this is somewhat subtle. So we were looking at this problem um, and in retrospect, it's sort of obvious, but often things, I, I feel like a lot of research is often like that. Um, but the max of unbiased estimators can still be biased. So imagine that you have two different distributions here, and this is the distribution of estimates that you would get um, of the value of those two different policies. And you can see that one of these has a much, has a different sort of distribution. It has higher variance than the other one. And so that means if you were to take a draw of these two distributions and then take a max, then the correct, the correct, um, the one that really has the higher value may not be picked more than 50% of the time. So this is an observation we made in um, our paper last year at UAI um, that was nice work by my student Shay Rudy and got this paper. And it was just highlighting that, you know, even if we can get the policy evaluation question done really well, it doesn't necessarily fully solve the optimization problem because ultimately we're gonna to wanna to take a max. We're gonna to wanna to think about which policy do we actually deploy in the future. So I think that um, this is particularly a problem in sort of indefinite horizon problems, which come up all the time when I look at them in my sorts of domains. So um, there's often the case that different policies will result in uh, students using the system for different amounts of time. So maybe policy one, students use it for a long time where they're reading a whole bunch and then they're doing some exercise. And policy two, when students do two exercises, they drop out really quick. And imagine that your behavior policy is you just alternate between showing people at random either a book or they get to do an exercise. Well, the longer your policy is, the more unlikely it is to get to observe that it matches your behavior policy. Yet that might really be exactly the policy. The policy one, assuming that that's actually effective, um, is exactly the one you want. So it might be that the policies that are actually better are least likely to be matched in your data, and therefore you're going to have the highest variance estimate of them. So this challenge of saying, like, if we want to start to do optimization and we want to find perhaps those really rare policies that actually do much better, for which we have very little data, we have very high variance estimators, is really challenging. Now, one of the things that can help in this case is doing sort of different forms of geometric weighting, and that can, that helped us sort of get around part of this problem. Um, but I think that there's a lot of really exciting work open to do. So I think that the work that I just discussed here sort of helps to illustrate some of the really nice um, open challenges and progress in how we can use old data to try to make better decisions in the future. Um, and I think it's allowing us to start to think about scaling up to important cases and also to tackle the type of real world settings that we'd like to. Um, but I think there's a lot of challenges still, um, particularly for policy optimization and in understanding and quantifying really how good these policies are before we deploy them particularly when we're using sort of these complex deep neural networks. Okay. So we have any questions about that before I go on to the next part? So I just talked about sort of trying to build reinforcement learning agents that reason about the past and really try to leverage their past experience in order to try and make better estimators um, about what decisions we might make in the future. But of course, intelligent behavior also involves evolving over time. And one of the really cool aspects about reinforcement learning agents is that they can actively gather their own data. They can change the sort of decisions they're making over time explicitly to try to increase their performance. So here's a scenario, which I think would be nice to have. So let's say, you know, um, a father and their, uh, their kid come into uh, school one day and a teacher says, we have this new state-of-the-art AI system to optimize your child's education. And the father says, great, how good is the system? And the teacher says, well, it will only at most fail to teach 10,000 students how to read. Everybody else is gonna learn the best possible um, and learn to read almost instantly, as best as you could possibly read. So what's the question that the father might ask at this point? Well, um, okay, so what's gonna happen for my kid? Am I gonna be one of the unfortunate ones for which my child doesn't learn to read? So this is the sort of, on the right-hand side is the types of guarantees we often have right now for reinforcement learning systems. 
Um, and I'm going to talk about sort of where we are now and where we might want to be. So let's go back to sort of thinking about what are the types of learning frameworks, formal learning frameworks we have in reinforcement learning. So on the x-axis here is episode. I'm thinking about episodic uh, reinforcement learning tasks. Um, so you can think of teaching a series of students or treating a series of patients. Um, and then on the uh, y-axis is return, just what our reward was for that particular episode. And let's think about knowing what the optimal average return should be. So we can think about over time, how well is our system doing? And one thing we could think of doing is sort of just looking at how far we are from optimal at each time point. So that would be these. So it says, okay, at each time point, sort of what was the difference between how good I could have done and what I actually did? And regret bounds add those up. So regret bounds just sort of sum up kind of the difference between how well we did and how well we could have done over time and provide bounds about how fast those grow. And one of the cool things about regret bounds is that they normally guarantee that asymptotically you have to get to the optimal policy. Which is nice. You'd sort of like to say, like, if I get more and more data, um, I should be able to get better and better and better. That's sort of one of the goals of machine learning. Okay, so that's one framework. Another really common framework that we have a lot of results for is PAC. So now we're going to think about all those mistakes we're making, and we're going to sort of threshold how bad they were. So we're going to say, okay, well, you know, some of them might have been really bad, and some of them might have only been kind of sort of bad, like within epsilon. And so I'm only going to count the things that are worse than epsilon willing to tolerate a little bit of suboptimality, um, but I want the things that are worse than that to be bounded. And I'm, when I count up all of those things that are worse than epsilon, I want them to be generally polynomial. And so this is like how we might get something that says, at most, it's going to make mistakes on 10,000 students, because we can count out the number of mistakes that are being made. So I think there's a lot of nice aspects of these frameworks. They sort of do something intuitively quite nice, which is it says our algorithms are going to be doing well over time. You're giving us some sort of guarantees of finite sample performance, um, and they're much stronger than things like asymptotic consistency. And I will note that a lot of these systems, we don't know anything of how deep reinforcement learning is doing in terms of these type of metrics. Um, and it turns out that sort of some of these different definitions can be incompatible and you can start to unite them. And so we have recent work on that. It's like, how do we have sort of satisfy both of these type of guarantees at the same time? But there's also some important limitations, um, which is, you know, when do these bad episodes happen? We don't know when they happen. The thing on the left and the thing on the right look the same. So because they both have the same total sum of mistakes and they also made the same number of epsilon mistakes. And so it doesn't give us information about when it happens um, and to whom it happens. So I think what we would really like is something like this, which is you want sort of per episode bounds for this context. So when the father says, okay, well, what about for my son? You'd like to be able to say something like, for students like your son, this AI system on average will be epsilon close to optimal. Okay, so maybe you wouldn't exactly say that to somebody that's not familiar with AI, but you might like to say something like that to be able to say, you know, this is, it's this close to how good it will be. We'll be able to make some bounds on performance for each individual episode. And so this recent work, which was led by uh, my student Chris Dan and also in collaboration with some uh, colleagues, Wei Wei and uh, Li Hong Li at Google, Re uh, Google Brain, um, is looking at what we're calling policy certificates to try to do sort of more accountable um, and transparent reinforcement learning by providing guarantees on the algorithm over time as it's operating. So what's the main insight here? Well, um, we want to be able to provide sort of individual policy certificates, which means that across episodes, before the algorithm executes, we want to be able to give a bound on its performance in terms of how suboptimal it might be. And if we can do this, then someone can intervene. So if that policy, if that bound is too large, if it's a high stakes patient decision um, and that's too large, then we might say, we're taking over. You know, the doctor is going to make decisions or I'm going to disregard the recommendations of the system. In the case of something like customers, you could imagine giving people a, like a coupon or not charging them for that round um, if they're willing to sort of tolerate that this might not be such a good user experience for, say, using Netflix or something like that. So there are different things we could do once we have this information, but this sort of reveals in advance how confident the algorithm is that it's going to do well or not. So 
The nice thing is that sort of between each of these, we're gonna output this certificate and then we can make these decisions. And we're gonna do this over time. And we're gonna ensure as well that these have to be getting better. So, yeah. Great question. So um, I, we're, I'll actually, let's see. I think it's two slides later. We are considering both a case where all the MDPs are the same and as well as we have some context. So and so context is different for each episode? Can be, yes, okay. exactly. Yeah, and I'll talk about sort of exactly how the richness of the setting we talk about in a second. So the type of guarantees that we'd wanna have here, actually I'll skip ahead to that and then, because I think it got out of order. So the setting here we're thinking about is what, um, sort of contextual Markov decision processes with a particular type of context. So we would love to be able to tackle sort of general deep reinforcement learning settings. We're not there yet. Um, but we'd like to move beyond tabular settings. So what we're imagining here is that individual episodes come in with a context, which could be a high dimensional feature vector, and that's static for the whole content, for the whole episode. So it's like a customer comes in, you know their gender, you know their age, you know their IP address, uh, maybe you know other aspects, and that's static for while the system is interacting with that individual, and that's gonna affect the transition model and the reward model. So you can see over here, what we're assuming is there's this sort of simple form of transition model and reward model, where we're assuming we have this static context and it interacts with an unknown parameter vector to determine the transition model and the reward model. And so the nice thing about this is that then we can share context, so we can sort of deal with a richer setting than tabular MDPs. Um, we're assuming that we have a tabular state that is changing during the episode, but the context is fixed. And so then across episodes, you could be selecting different um, contexts, and then you'd like to be able to provide these guarantees for those different contexts before you act. So, in particular, once we receive the context, um, then we have to output our certificate. And it has to be an upper bound on how suboptimal the policy is gonna be. Um, and we also wanna be able to bound sort of how many large certificates we output. So we can't just say, we're never sure, we're never sure, we're never sure. Um, we have to be able to make good estimates for many of the individuals. And we have to be able to bound the number of times we not, might not be able to. So I just want to highlight here this sort of, I think this is interesting in terms of understanding uh, why our system might make bad decisions. There's at least two reasons. One is that a new context might be very unusual. So maybe a new patient comes in and they're very, very different than any patients you've seen before. And so in those scenarios, naturally, just like in generally sort of in supervised machine learning, you would expect to not be able to do very well for that case because it is a rare, you don't have much data about that particular scenario, and so in general, your confidence will be less. So that's one form. But the other reason why you might not have a very good confidence interval is if your algorithm is exploring. So we're in the reinforcement learning setting case, and so sometimes, you know, you might be trying out new strategies. You might be trying out new types of ways of serving ads to customers, and they might fail. And so in those cases, that might be very good or it might be very bad. And so that's sort of um, uncertainty that's due to the algorithm process versus uncertainty due to the context. And I think there's really interesting questions too about separating these out and revealing them to say a decision maker so that they could think about whether or not they wanna intervene. So if it's a very unusual scenario, even if someone intervenes, we might not do very well. Um, if it's just due to the fact that the algorithm's exploring, then maybe that sometimes that's a risk we may or may not wanna take. So I just wanna briefly highlight that this is connected to a number of different types of frameworks, um, uh, things like QUIC um, and policy evaluation, but it's sort of combining between these types of ideas that I was mentioning at the beginning of saying, we wanna be able to give um, and think about estimates for single episodes as well as algorithms that learn across time. So we first thought about this for tabular Markov decision processes where there's no context. Um, and we can kind of just output these confidence intervals over time um, so that we understand how well the algorithm is doing. In this case, we can prov prove a bound on sort of the number of possible mistakes we might make in this setting, which means across episodes, um, how many times, you know, is it, how many times will we be sort of suboptimal? Uh, will it be 10,000 students? Will it be 1,000 students? Will it be a million? How can we quantify that while simultaneously giving guarantees for each individual student?
Another approach is thinking about Markov decision processes with this linear context, which I think is the more interesting one. And in this case, we're building on some of the nice recent work on contextual bandits and sort of ellipsoid confidence intervals um, and using that to get sort of cumulative guarantees in terms of regret. So just to summarize sort of the advantages of these uh, new frameworks is that we can give a certificate for individual estimate episodes. We can also ensure that after a certain amount of time you can get an epsilon optimal policy. So you can be sure that you can output something that's gonna be useful. We know when you've got a good enough policy, if you have a particular epsilon you're interested in. Um, it automatically implies a lot of these previous bounds, these sort of learning frameworks, which is nice. Um, and one of the other really nice aspects is that a lot of the sort of optimism-based uh, exploration strategies that have been used successfully in prior work can also be employed here. So I think just to summarize this, then I think this is a step towards these sort of policy certificates is a step towards making things more accountable and transparent. And I think that can be particularly really useful for high stakes scenarios. I think that there's a lot of really interesting next steps. Um, in particular, these bounds are all for sort of generic worst case MDPs. Um, but in reality, fortunately, the world is much, much nicer than that often. Um, and often there's a lot of structure in your domain. So I think developing better senses of instant dependent bounds, which means that as if we want to democratize AI, you don't want everyone to have to have taken reinforcement learning to decide whether or not to model their problem as a bandit or, or as an MDP. You'd like to just have good algorithms that you could deploy. And if it turns out you know, it's an MDP, then maybe you need a bit more data. If it turns out it's a bandit, you need less data in order to do well. And so we've taken some steps towards that of trying to have algorithms that can pretend the world is an MDP, but if it's really a bandit, they do as well as if you said it was a bandit. Um, I also think there's really interesting questions here about you know, how do we just generally scale this up to continuous state spaces, as well as better understanding the individual outcomes for one particular trajectory. So you'll notice here that um, what I said is that for students like your son, on average, you're gonna be epsilon k worse. But of course, for real people, you can't reset them. We can't like have them go through k through five and then say, oops, we didn't do that right. We're gonna reset you and try that again. Like, as people, we only get to experience one trajectory through life. And so in many of these cases, we don't want to think about expected outcomes. We might want to think about single trajectory outcomes or the distribution of returns one single person might experience. So just to summarize, I think that there's a lot of really exciting work to be done in terms of creating these sort of more accountable, efficient reinforcement learning algorithms. I think that there's a lot of really exciting progress that's happening, you know, both from some of my students as well as in a number of other labs, and I think that there's a lot of really exciting directions. Thanks.